Welcome, and thank you for joining the Market Surveillance Committee meeting. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. Please note that all connections are muted until the Q&A portion of the call. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. To ask a question, press pound 2 on your telephone keypad. You will hear notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your name and question. With that, I'll turn the call over to Dr. Benjamin Hobbs, Chair of the Market Surveillance Committee. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Andre, and thanks to all of you on the lines for joining us today. Good afternoon. Uh, this is the second half of today's double header, and uh, hopefully be as exciting a game as the first one this morning. Um, and as a uh, reminder, tomorrow there's a third market surveillance committee meeting which will address um, Order 831, and that's at 3 p.m. tomorrow, uh, the draft for uh, the, the draft uh, MSC opinion for Order 831 has been posted. So uh, we're here today to consider a uh, draft opinion on the phase four of the energy storage and distributed energy resources initiative of the ISO. Um, with me are doctors Jim Bushnell and Scott Harvey of the MSC. And from the ISO, we have uh, several staff members, including uh, Bridget Sparks, Gabe Murtaugh, John Gooden, Greg Cook, uh, and Shami Davis. Is there anybody else? Okay, I think that's so, it, Ben. Okay, I think, I think we've covered it. Um, so, um, as we always have the agenda, we have an opportunity for public comment on, in which I ask you to limit those comments to issues other than what we're talking about today, um, and that they will be followed by a, a summary of the uh, opinion, uh, which I'll give, and then comments from other MSC members, uh, and then we'll open up the lines to comments and questions from uh, uh, the public, after which we will, uh, I will um, welcome a, um, a motion to approve uh, the opinion, and uh, which may be uh, modified um, at that time. Okay, so before we go to public comment, I'd just like to point out that uh, one thing that's been on everybody's mind, the events of last month, um, the ISO has announced, uh, I believe, that there will be a report issued sometime next week, the week of the uh, 14th, uh, on the causes and how the markets responded and uh, potential and some potential policy options. And uh, there will certainly be opportunities uh, for discussion of that report in ISO meetings um, and also the next MSC meeting. Um, and so uh, you know, I'd prefer that we not have extensive discussion of that, of that issue since there'll be that opportunity uh, in the very near future, although uh, certainly uh, welcome any brief comments on that. So um, uh, Andre, could you uh, invite uh, folks to queue up for uh, comments in the public comment period at this time? Opening the call to questions now. If you have any questions, please raise your hand by pressing pound two. Pound two on your telephone keypad will indicate that you have a question. Going once, going twice, not seeing any hands raised at this time. Okay. Um, I, I'm sure folks will make up for it uh, uh, later. Okay, so uh, first um, there'll be a summary of the opinion and um, there are a lot of uh, moving parts to ESDER IV, um, and we are focusing on three of them. Um, there are certainly other important ones as well, but the three parts that we focused on is uh, the allowing of um, scheduling coordinators to specify an <coughs> end of hour state of charge parameter that constrains operation of the battery in the real-time markets. Um, 
Second, um, there's market power mitigation for storage, uh, which is not presently a feature of the local market power mitigation system. Um, and uh, our comments focus on calculation of default energy bids. Um, third, um, uh, uh, for something completely different, um, we're, we'll have, we have some comments on the role of effective load carrying capability in the ISO markets, the importance of uh, uh, gauging it accurately, and some suggestions for precisely how it, it might be used. Um, each of these, of course, could take up a meeting like this, an entire opinion by itself. Um, so so uh, to begin with, I'll summarize um, our conclusions uh, concerning the end of our state of charge. So the need for this arises from the finite time horizon in the real-time markets, such that the, uh, the energy that remains in storage at the time horizon has an economic value uh, that would be missed if uh, the market software doesn't allow that to be constrained or valued at the end. If the, if the market software thinks that the world ends, in effect, uh, at, at the time horizon, then there's incentive to overuse um, um, the, the energy during um, the time period covered by the optimization. Um, so this is a, a, a widely understood, widely appreciated feature of uh, optimization models that optimize, schedule something over a period of time that if you have a, a short time horizon that you can distort decisions. Um, and there are two, at least two standard approaches to trying to correct for that, and one of them is um, what's called the primal approach, where you constrain some of the decision variables, and in this case, constrain uh, the state of charge at the, uh, at the time horizon or at some point in between um, to reflect that uh, the energy is otherwise uh, undervalued, so you conserve some for a, subsequent periods. Um, uh, an alternative approach, and actually one that uh, we recommend also be considered, so they could be used in tandem, is to have uh, an energy value, which of course is exactly analogous to what uh, folks at hydro facilities do. A value have, they have a value of water, um, and um, so if there's a value of energy in the, in the battery at the, uh, in the time horizon, um, this would allow for more rational trade-offs of um, the, the value of using the, uh, the, the energy now versus the energy later. Um, this is something that could be simply a, a number, dollar per megawatt hour, or it could be a schedule because uh, the more energy you have in a battery, uh, because of uh, uh, limitations in the discharge rate, um, the less valuable uh, the marginal um, uh, uh, marginal energy is. So you could have a nonlinear schedule. You could have something like a <clears throat> end of our end of our state of charge target with a um, a low uh, value of energy above that and a higher one below that. So allowing deviations from um, that target if it turns out that prices are very high uh, now, or allowing or, or encouraging more storage of energy if it turns out that the value of energy is, that, that prices are, are low um, over, the time, uh, over the time horizon. Um, so an issue though, uh, an inescapable issue is that this could be used to exercise market power, um, either to um, encourage um, overuse of energy in the near term and squeezing the system later on, or the reverse, squeezing the system now and saving the energy for later. And I encourage you to read uh, uh, an article by Jim Bushnell in Operations Research on how this could, how this sort of thing could be used over a longer time period for hydro units to uh, um, uh, manipulate the market by spilling water strategically, uh, and that can be here. So. Now, how would one apply local market power mitigation to this? 
We do not have um, a hard and fast criterion in mind, um, so we suggest that if repeatedly over several days there's an end of hour state of charge value that is specified as much higher or perhaps much lower than what a, a day ahead solution might indicate, or that if um, an economic value of that energy is, is specified, if that's allowed. Um, and if it turns out that after the fact, real-time prices repeatedly do not economically justify uh, that withholding, that the resource could then be constrained from setting a state of charge uh, appreciably different, for example, from what IFM indicates is optimal. Uh, there are issues with this because opportunity cost does, does, uh, arises not just because there's a value for the energy beyond the, the time horizon in the real-time market. It's also because um, the deterministic market software may undervalue um, the, op, uh, the um, option value of storage in that uh, the market software will tend to have a smoother trajectory of prices in real time than are actually realized. And so with more volatility to real time prices than the market software shows, storage will have a greater um, uh, option value. And that's part of the opportunity cost too. And that's not necessarily something that will be uh, most appropriately captured by uh, end of hour state of charge parameter or uh, energy or energy value and so uh, these are these are difficult issues that um, certainly will not be resolved by this initiative or by um, um, the, the the further work the ISO is going to be doing this fall on day ahead uh, depths um, given the growing importance of storage and the likely huge role it will have over the next few decades, these are issues that will be returned to and refined, or maybe even, um, or maybe the ISO's approach will be greatly changed as a result. So, this opinion should not necessarily be viewed as a recommendation of what should be implemented now, but rather uh, we raise issues that should be considered as the ISO's approach evolves. And, for example, in the um, uh, deliberations this fall. Um, okay, uh, that was the first topic, end of hour state of charge. The second topic was uh, mitigation of storage offers. And um, first, I'd just like to point out that uh, um, the, the concept of a safe harbor doesn't presently exist in local market power mitigation and could be applied to any resources. So you could always argue that there's some de minimis size that, you know, a, a resource really can't. Um, affect market power in a, in a load pocket. Um, and we think, though, that, um, that an exception is justified for storage because, first of all, storage um, often does come in a lot smaller lumps, um, and it just makes things more complex if every uh, battery installation is mitigated. And second, um, there are higher potential negative consequences of, of mitigating storage. And the technology is evolving very quickly, as, uh, for example, Gabe pointed out in, um, you know, the discussions over the last year um, in trying to understand cycling costs. The cycling costs for lithium-ion batteries may be very different than for others. So rather than lock in a particular approach for all size batteries, it would be better just to focus on larger ones. Well, we don't have a recommendation for a particular size, but clearly it depends on the size of the uh, load pocket or the uh, uh, the amount of constrained flow uh, and, and on the size of the facility. Um, okay. Um, the topic that takes up most of the opinion is the definition of DEBS, and uh, basically we it defined, uh, there are two systems. One is, let's call it system B, which is a, a baseline, which is what the ISO proposes, uh, in which all four costs are included in um, offers to discharge or bids to charge. And these are uh, opportunity costs, uh, charging costs, uh, losses, and cycling costs. And then something I call the, uh, 
the purist approach, um, where which recognizes that the ISO software under certain conditions already calculates opportunity costs and charging costs um, uh, implicitly, and you don't need to bid those. Just like for the flexible ramping product, we don't bid opportunity costs because the software automatically calculates those. Um, and for the same reason, if you have an ending state of charge or a value of energy, at that time, the software will uh, correctly sort of infer what all those costs are and what the value of energy are in all intervals prior to that. With the exception of this option value that um, I mentioned in, in real time, the fact that um, because there's higher volatility real time prices and the software recognizes, storage may have a higher opportunity cost. Um, that's, that's the one exception. But at any rate, um, and uh, the uh, this approach, uh, say call it A for alternative approach or purist approach, its attractiveness is, is that it's simpler than uh, because you just need um, sort of the ending conditions, the value or the um, uh, end of hour state of charge. You don't need to specify numbers in every interval. Um, the software automatically calculates things um, to do um, the what the ISO does um, in equations, you know, uh, one and two, there are a lot of complex calculations that, uh, as we point out in the opinion, um, actually are, are, are simplifications or approximations that result in some inaccuracies. Um, and, and so, uh, whereas um, a correct derivation from the purest point of view w wouldn't necessarily have those. And then finally, a final, a third advantage of the purest approach is that if the resource owner updates its value of energy or state of charge parameter, as of course it can um, under the ISO's proposal, it can, uh, it can update that parameter. Um, during the day, it might better reflect um, um, uh, real-time conditions forecast than using uh, data from the IFM to try to estimate charging costs and others. Um, so as an example of a distortion, the use of uh, charging costs incurred prior to the binding interval in the real-time market, that's a sunk cost, and in theory, that should not uh, affect what you should be willing to discharge for. Um, we recognize that sunk costs are sometimes used by uh, regulated utilities because they're required, for example, for the, the charge their fuel costs, which they've already contracted the cost, uh, that's, that's sunk. Um, but as an economic principle, uh, sunk costs should not affect uh, a willingness, uh, the bids and discharge. Um, okay. Um, so now there's the issue of market power mitigation, and this does not solve that. You still, you still would have to then mitigate the state of charge and the value state of charge parameter and or the value of energy. Um, so it, it's, um, it's some of the fundamental issues are not taken care of by the, by the purest approach. And so it, it may not be uh, practical. Um, okay. Um, Finally, I would like to talk a little bit about the ELCC part of the proposal. Um, we're, I imagine we're going to get a lot more discussion of DEBS over the next few months in the context of the day ahead market, so, and, and perhaps uh, over the coming years. Um, in the ELCC part of the proposal, the, uh, it, it basically summarizes a, a study by E3 of the capacity contribution of uh, demand response, and um, talks about um, the, the E3 proposal, talks about what you could do with that information and the fact that there are various uh, flavors, Baskin, it's a Baskin Robbins of ELCC in terms of how you calculate ECC, ELCC. Is it average? Is it over portfolio? First in, last in? 
And so we have some comments on uh, the general framework. Um, uh, so very generally, um, if you're going to have a re, um, uh, an RA market in which RA contract payments are an important contribution to, uh, to covering the capital costs of resources, um, you should calculate ca uh, capacity credits in a way that reflects the value to the system. And um, the, the Garver ELCC approach, uh, which was first developed for uh, uh, plants that have independent outages and whose outages are independent of loads, um, is a theoretically correct approach that basically um, uh, for a given number of megawatts of a resource, um, how many megawatts of a perfectly flexible, perfectly reliable resource would be equivalent uh, to, the, to that resource? It's a, it, 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 say it that way, it sounds pretty simple, but of course the calculations are incredibly difficult when today um, uh, resource availability is correlated within a resource class, correlated with other resources, correlated with loads, there's storage, there's uh, imports, um, um, the uh, marginal credits are very different than the average credits when there are correlations within a class, especially when there are correlations within a class. Um, so you can have an average capacity credit for say uh, wind that's in the, in the 20s, but if you have a lot of wind development, the marginal, the marginal capacity contribution might be in the teens or below 10, um, uh, for example. And if you want to incent the construction, if, if we're using RA to incent uh, investment, then um, you should reward the marginal credits. Um, and that, that creates some conceptual difficulties, things that are hard to get people, you wrap your head around. In a sense, the right reserve margin is negative. Um, which uh, we can talk about that, but um, it, it, uh, E3 talks about using a, a blend of different ELCCs to calculate the payments. Uh, there may be practical reasons to do that, but the economics say that um, if you want to provide the right incentive that is proportional to the value of the system, it should be the, the, the marginal uh, that matters. Now, if you're trying to figure out what, um, uh, what resource adequacy looks like for, say, a summer outlook, you know, you're back last spring and you're looking at the summer, well, it's really the overall adequacy of the fleet and not the marginal that's so important. So the average ELCC is definitely something that's also of interest, but in terms of market incentives. Um, this is all particularly difficult to assess for a demand, uh, demand response because it's not called on very often. You don't have um, um, a lot of data on, on actual performance when called upon under, under a range, range of conditions. And we see that in the stakeholder comments uh, on the E3 study. Um, and we see that also in DMMN's, DMM's assessment of what DR has contributed um, and the comments on those studies. Uh, it just shows, it shows how difficult it is, but we still think it's worthwhile trying to do it right. And the E3 study is a step, a step in the right direction. There are definitely ways it could be improved, but they're a step in the right direction. Uh, the final point I'd like to make about uh, ELCC is that um, to, we believe that to the extent that you reward resources for delivering energy when and where it's most valuable, rather than having an annual ex ante payment based on some sort of average performance or anticipated performance of those costs, we, to the extent that you actually reward it and you have uh, rewards or penalties if you're available when the system really needs you like in mid-August, it, it then becomes less important what the ex ante capacity credit is um, because less of the, uh, the contribution to capital will come through that and more of it will be, uh, it'll be affected by your actual performance. Um, 
coming up with performance incentives for a resource like demand response or free renewables, whose availability is, of course, definitely depends strongly on uh, meteorological and other conditions. So if you only, you know, have a couple observations a year where you really uh, uh, calculate these penalties or rewards, um, um, that's, that's a pretty small sample. It's not easy, but I, we think that the, the, the principle is right. And um, uh, Jim, among others, may have more to say about this. So I, uh, I've said a lot about the three parts of this uh, long opinion, and I'd like to uh, turn to Scott and Jim uh, to see whether they have anything to add at this time. This is Jim. I, that, that was a lot, so I think we should uh, hear from the stakeholders. We do have one hand raised going to the phone lines now. Okay. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, this is uh, this is Alva from PG&E. I wasn't sure whether you wanted to have uh, Scott weigh in first, though, uh, Ben. Uh, no, I'm happy to yeah, listen to yeah, Once you talk, and then, uh, as Jim said, then we can have some more discussion among us, but why don't we uh, give you a chance to fire back at us first? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I Actually, I thought the, the, the summary was very fair, and I, and I think it's a, it's a very rich uh, paper that you've constructed here. I, I expressed some concern privately about this being – something that could potentially, um, if not derail, it could, could be uh, taken as a, as a means of, of uh, keeping the ESDRA 4 implementation from, from occurring uh, ver versus sort of pointing towards ESDRA 5 and 6. So I've, 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 I, I, I don't think that was the intent, and I'm not hearing it expressed that way. But you're, you're welcome to say, in, in fact, that was the intent. But I do want to make just a couple of points. Um, one is on the, the issue of um, the, uh, your, your potential uh, test of market power on the use of the end of hour constraint. I think it's, um, I mean, my understanding of this constraint is a little different from the one that you've, you've the, the way you've described it. I, th I see it as more of addressing contractual requirements, like basically a battery is being used for distribution purposes or for a customer or uh, otherwise has a requirement that it be at a certain capacity at a certain time of day. Um, and essentially, the way that the system is set up right now, the only place that a, that a upmarket participant will be able to really control that except through bids is in real time. Now, in, in, in day ahead, it may be possible to, uh, you know, control that to, to a greater or lesser extent with bids. But under any kind of must-offer requirement, I think the day-head results may not be as predictable as you're, you're essentially presupposing. And so, um, you know, it may be that, a, custom, that a, um, a market participant doesn't see the market, the target state of charge being attained in day-ahead consistently. And in that case, they will need to put in the constraint consistently, and you'll get exactly the result you're talking about, where a, a state of charge in real time is consistently differing significantly from the, the day ahead results. So I think um, that kind of use for operational need is going to uh, call into question that type of test for the end of hour. Um, and the only other point I wanted to, to make in looking at your paper was, and this question of sunk costs is, um, that on um, in, on mitigation is that it, it, oftentimes batteries may be bidding on the margin in real time, you know, in addition to whatever they've been awarded in the day ahead, and so they would be looking at marginal incremental charging versus marginal incremental discharging, and the and the arbitrage that they're trying to embed in their bids may look exactly the same as it did day ahead. They may, they may not be looking at the sunk charging costs. Um, and, it, um, and so uh, it, it will be based on their forecast and potentially the ISO may mitigate based on their assessment of what is a, a, a reasonable uh, charging cost. Um, I'm not sure if I agree that the ISO can, can can uh, optimize uh, for a particular market participant's objectives without having the, uh, the participant's concept of charging costs 
as well as their opportunity costs. I think there may be many situations where it's very difficult to estimate the marginal opportunity cost, and it's much easier to estimate charging costs plus a variable O&M cost and construct bids according to that means. So I, I think there's a, it's actually uh, simplifies bidding under many circumstances to have both of those terms in the, in the, in the default energy bid. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Alva. So uh, a couple of quick responses on my part. This is uh, Ben. Um, so uh, the contractual requirements uh, for individual customers or distribution, for example, uh, that is something that we did, did not mention, and um, I, I think you're correct on that. Um, of course, we would not want to see uh, contractual requirements getting in the way of, um, uh, if there's a situation where a large battery facility does have market power and uh, claims that contracts uh, are limiting the, you know, limit the flexibility that it can be used. Um, in general, we've been, uh, we and I think DMM have been skeptical of the role of contracts and there aren't uh, uh, physical reasons to, uh, uh, to, take a, uh, to uh, use that flexibility. I think we'll hear more of this when in the uh, hybrid uh, resource uh, uh, initiative that's, that's upcoming. Um, yeah. Yeah. Under uh, some cost and mitigation, so um, the point about uh, uh, option value for selling in real time actually also applies to charging costs in real time. Uh, you, if, if there's a lot of volatility in real time costs, you could take advantage of that during the very low real time prices and, and, and grab some of that power. And so the, uh, the estimates of discharge costs are, in, in theory, um, subject to the, the sa uh, same bias just in the opposite direction as the, um, uh, the optical costs for selling. Uh, I definitely agree that, um, that, the, that looking forward in the real-time market, um, there, it, it may be optimal to charge and then discharge, and so the charging costs um, in the uh, binding or uh, early advisory intervals may be uh, important, but um, uh, on the other hand, the uh, ISO software does account account for that. It balances the, the value, the cost of charging that against the the later um, uh, value of selling it. Again, if you have the um, you know ending state of charge or value of energy constraints in there, um, um, I, I I just don't. It, I think it's you know similar again to the FlexiRamp product in that I don't think you need to bid opportunity costs or discharge costs if the system uh, automatically considers those. Um, well, I think but these, these are all issues. Talk more, and I definitely, pre definitely appreciate your comments. Uh, yeah, let me just you. see if Scott, um, uh, Jim, want to add and then uh, yeah, give you well, a chance. This is, this is Scott. Uh, I guess a couple comments. I think in general I – you know, the issues you talked about are why I think we'd like to have more flexibility in, in bidding for the operators of uh, storage resources, and we don't want to apply mitigation to people who don't have any conceivable market power. So as Ben said, uh, you know, we, it, it, this is an area where it's going to be increasingly important to uh, have safe harbors for uh, small battery resources that uh, there's no plug, don't have local market power when we have ramps across the state that we aren't uh, uh, mitigating them um, unnecessarily when there's no potential for, for market power. And the, the issues that Ben talked about of the software will optimize everything it can optimize, but it, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily see all these variations in prices over time. You can just see that dramatically just comparing to the FMM prices to the RTD prices, and they don't see right. the, uh, the volatility that occurs in RTD. So that, I think, is a reason to, to have that in mind as we design the system and provide flexibility for market participants to, uh, to exercise some judgment to avoid uh, over-optimization that actually isn't optimizing in the, in the, in the software. So those are my thoughts. Uh, this is Jim. I'll, uh, Alva's comments raised one thought I hadn't had.
had before, which is it, to the extent the end of hour state of charge requirements are motivated by sort of longstanding um, contractual requirements, then they could perhaps be set and held over a longer time frame in a unit master file or something like that, you know, with shorter time frame, rather than, you know, specified on a daily or hourly basis. And that would limit the ability to use those types of constraints as a backdoor way of exercising market power. So that might help in certain ways if, if, the, if truly the motivation is, is from something that's not really uh, requiring to a response to market conditions right now, um, then it maybe it, it won't be as vulnerable to abuse. Um, but overall, I, I think the yeah, what Scott, I agree with, with what Scott was saying that there, there are a lot of challenges to mitigating these types of resources, and even if we do come up with the perfect deb, there seems to be ways to exercise market power anyways by either preventing the battery from being charged or requiring a state of charge be at a certain level and, and those sorts of means. And it makes me wonder over the long run if we need to rethink sort of uh, or have a different approach for these types of devices if we are going to mitigate them um, that, that would not be a DEB-like approach, that would be sort of more of a holistic all-day management kind of approach rather than something that's trying to um, interval by interval regulate what the bids should be. Um, but I, I don't know what that would look like, but I do, it, it, there are so many concerns about the sort of traditional approach to mitigation here that it, that it definitely, I think, deserves some deeper thoughts about whether there's another approach that, that might be a better fit. And in the meantime, you know, there are some real risks to over-mitigating here that we, we want to be mindful of. Uh, can I uh, take on a couple of seconds? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, just uh, on the – before I get to the um, the issue of the, 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 the end of our – on the default energy bids, I will say I, I came into the initiative pretty concerned about the way it was being formulated, and I really appreciated the work that you uh, did and what Gabe did with the work that you did. Uh, I, I, I consider that what's being presented now as default energy bid to be a good foundation for any, any kind of documentation of what if, if the if uh, a market participant is you know essentially however you want to put it behaving correctly or operating according to least cost dispatch their bids should look something like that and to the extent they vary there should be a reason for it um, which brings me to the question of I, I think Jim's idea is a very plausible one um, but it's uh, it becomes a source of inflexibility if it's in the master file maybe a necessary source of inflexibility. But just to point out, um, I think this, the concept of a, uh, a target state of charge is now being uh, considered very strongly by CAISO to uh, guarantee uh, peaking discharge for RA uh, uh, batteries, number one. Number two, the whole uh, storage as a transmission asset initiative in my mind, and I, I, I welcome correction, but it seemed to revolve around the idea that you had to be at a certain state of charge for transmission purposes at a certain time of day, and there was a question of how you were going to get that. Um, and it, and it's, it's, um, both, both of those indicate that the ISO acknowledges that this is a real challenge, and I think you, you sort of have to say what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If, if, a, if a market participant has a legitimate need which should, I agree, should be documentable. You should be able to say this is a multi-use battery, and and one of its uses is for distribution, and therefore uh, we are, we have to be able to, on certain days of the year to say the battery needs to be at 80% in hour 15, um, and it, it and and it's it's very possible the ISO should know about that, um, and it shouldn't be just something that the market participant just simply pulls out of their their pocket. But um, but I, I I do think those are real. Um, constraints that would go beyond uh, the kind of, um, you know, cost, market 
market contracting costs that have been the concern of the DMM. I, I think these are these are essentially being used now to support batteries, um, you know, being constructed. And if you say, well, we're going to um, we're not planning on observing those limits. Uh, in a sense, you should tell it. You should say it right now and very clearly because uh, it may be that people are counting on those um, constraints being observed in order to be able to, uh, um, you know, operationalize the uh, what they're developing. Okay, okay thank you. Have, we do have another hand raised. Going to the next caller. Thank you, Andre. <clears throat> Uh, hi, Market Surveillance Committee. This is Alex Morris from the California Energy Storage Alliance, and uh, just wanted to make a few comments and ask a question. Uh, very, very quickly, our sort of CSIS perspectives on this. Um, uh, we're supportive of the end of our state of charge. We know that there will be a, a consideration of how that may affect UCAP, which is happening in the resource adequacy enhancements. And so, for, for purposes here in ESDER, we are supportive of the end of our state of charge, and we'd really like that to move forward because we see that as an important tool for managing state of charge in real time. Uh, on the matter of market power mitigation and default energy bids, uh, my question for you is sort of how should we approach this given the following? And, you know, we support the fact that you need market power mitigation, and we recognize we need some methodology for calculating it. We've looked at um, having a default bid curve so that the storage could be dispatched smartly. And we've also had this other principle, which is sort of a, you know, don't harm the resource. So, net, you know, try to avoid a situation where um, a resource under recovers its costs, which is obviously, you know, unacceptable. So uh, that said, we sort of think that there may need to be some tuning on this once we build more experience. And I would welcome your input on that idea, and how would you recommend the ISO deal with some of the potential for uncertain outcomes here or the desire to tune the, the default, the dev calculation? So, Alex, you mean uh, how, the, how the present proposal might be tweaked or adjusted in the future, is that what you're asking? Yeah, um, and, and I say that because, uh, you know, our concern is we, we do recognize the need to move forward, but we also, uh, you know, are, are wary of having something over-mitigated or, um, you know, materially harmed if it under-recovers its cost due to, a, you know, a flawed default energy bid calculation. So that's kind of our strategy here is to think about helping the ISO move forward, but also um, preventing bad outcomes that we think would be unreasonable. And so we're just trying to recognize that. I mean, do you think there is a chance that we would want to tweak this in an Ezra 5? Uh, you know, have you learned from the rest of the country uh, other strategies for dealing with uncertainty in the DEB? Do you think it's reasonable that individual storage companies would go get distinct um, default energy bid calculations through uh, Potomac Analytics or something like that? So I'm just sort of asking so that I can inform our members on what the MSC's sort of confidence in this design is and, and when we think this might come back um, for tweaking, if at all. So I could, uh, just, just speaking for myself, I, I, the calculation of opportunity costs and going forward recharging costs, uh, based on what comes out of some other market solution has a little bit of the flavor of chasing one's own tail. Um, the, and when the inputs of that are, are, are uncertain, you know, or you know, we wind up using IFM-based um, opportunity costs when we know in real time the opportunity cost may be a bit different. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether there's going to be a large benefit to refining equation one, uh, and which is and this is one reason why um, one could argue for the purest approach, which just says um, here you know if, we, if if 
if it was a single large system, this is how you would optimize it. You would only consider you'd have parameters for cycling cost and uh, losses, and you would just uh, let it be allocated in the, the way that that's best without trying to have bids in each interval. So I think this is closer to what Jim was perhaps expressing as a philosophy of looking at the, the day holistically. So I, I'm not terribly optimistic that an interval by interval calculation of, of opportunity cost and uh, discharge costs and applying those interval by interval can be uh, improved very much. One thing that can be improved, and you know, Gabe did a, a remarkable amount of work over the last year, especially uh, last summer and the fall, trying to figure out a, a better way of including uh, cycling costs, which depend on depth of cycle and um, uh, the, his, the history of the use of the, uh, the batteries. Um, and that turned out not to be uh, at least the theoretically correct one for lithium ion, turned out to be not terribly workable, but that's something that, you know, depending on computational uh, experience in the future and a, um, a confirmation of our, you know, increasing impression that that um, um, like that that uh, cycling costs, replacement costs are hugely important in how you use batteries and so forth. That's something that might be improved as uh, in the future um, when uh, you know the market software becomes more capable of uh, doing that. And we can also see how the software would would use batteries once we get into a situation where. Uh, batteries start being used for arbitrage a lot more than they are now. Uh, you know, right now batteries aren't being used for arbitrage, so we're not observing over, you know, overly deep cycling and so forth. But conceivably, we might see that uh, uh, see that in the future. So uh, that's certainly one area: the cycling costs, where I can imagine that that's going to be revisited and refined. Um, and there is a, a good, you know, theoretical basis for that, uh, which may be technology dependent. Whereas for, you know, the basis for estimating opportunity costs and um, uh, discharge costs interval by interval, as I said, has kind of that chasing your tail flavor, and it really is just simpler to do what I suggest. Um, but that, but given what, uh, you know, that, that there are um, option values and uh, having the energy to take advantage of real-time price volatility that's missed by the market software, uh, that might result in, in some tweaking as well, and maybe there's some way that those opportunity costs can be um, roughly estimated and included. If indeed they turn out to be important, um, it'd be nice to see those estimated. Scott or Jim, do you have any? Yeah. yeah. You know, for, for one point, Alex, I think, again, going back to what we said about not mitigating resource owners that don't have market power, it's one thing if it's a 500-megawatt battery. It's another thing if it's a 50-megawatt battery. And mm -hmm. the best way to provide the flexibility and avoid adverse impacts from bad debts is not to mitigate people who don't have market power. Uh, and then, secondly, I guess, I... Uh, I am more concerned with Ben about uh, the, the ability of the ISO software to optimize uh, over time, given that it doesn't see the, the variability, and that uh, I therefore think giving people more bid flexibility uh, is better, and that also may make it more give, may enable us to give them give them more bidding flexibility because they. They can ex express their bids in a way that isn't really market power, but you know, holding back a little bit of capacity, but making most of it available and setting uh, uh, reservation prices. And the mm -hmm. one concern I have is that, you know, the idea. One of the ideas we've talked about for some time is uh, having reservation prices that depend on the state of charge of the resource. And I gather the CAISOs found that to be somewhat intractable. But I think we ought to talk about that, have a discussion of why it's intractable, uh, you know, at some point, and uh, think maybe there's other ways to get around it before we uh, go too far down a, a, an extremely narrow set of bid options for uh, for storage owners, and then start applying uh, mitigation to it. So those are my thoughts. Okay. 
That's helpful. And thanks, Dr. Hans, too. Um, sure. Yeah, so that's the extent of my question. questions. Uh, um, just anticipating that this, this issue may require tuning and wanting to hear your thoughts on that. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Alex. Um, Andre, uh, anybody else in line? No, we do not have any other hands raised at this time. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, appreciate the, the good discussion, everybody. So um, at this point, then, we can move on to uh, consideration of adoption of the opinion, and um, I would entertain a motion to do so. Scott moves to adopt it. Uh, this is Jim. I second the motion. Okay. Um, it's been moved to adopt the opinion uh, by Scott and uh, seconded by Jim. Um, does anybody want to propose any changes, corrections, or anything else to the opinion? Scott does not. Neither do I. Okay, and, and neither do I. Okay, so I can call for a vote then. Um, so let's see, the, the motion has been made and seconded that uh, the opinion on energy storage and distributed energy resources phase four uh, by the MSC be adopted. Um, and I'll take the vote, Scott? Yes. Uh, Jim? Yes. And um, I vote yes, so it's been adopted unanimously. Okay, uh, thank you everybody. So. Um, uh, we usually have a, a, a future business item at the end of the agenda. Just mention that tomorrow we will be meeting again at 2 p.m. Pacific time to talk about Order 831, uh, which is, is extremely timely um, and uh, an interesting issue that I that I expect and at least hope for uh, some vigorous discussion tomorrow. Um, so I look forward to hearing from, uh, from you all tomorrow. Uh, Jim and Scott, anything you want to add? No. Nope. Okay. From uh, the, the staff, Bridget, Gabe, uh, Greg, John, Shami, anything to add? No, thanks. Nope. Okay. Well, Okay. Well, thanks. We, uh, we do have another hand raised. Would you like to take it? Um, um, sure. I'll just quickly thank. Um, so um, uh, the the five some who produced the, produced this proposal, um, you're right up there in my mind with the Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, John, Jill, Gabe, uh, Bridget, and Lauren. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, operator. I guess we'll take the the last hand. Caller, please go ahead. Good morning. This is Connie with regarding the Ezra Phase 4 initiative uh, timeline. So I believe the comments are due this week and appreciate the MSC's opinion. It's a lot to consider. And so for that reason, I wanted to find out if the CIFA will be extending the deadline for comments to next week. I didn't catch I like the question. It was hard to hear. Uh, the question the was, question are you going to extend the deadline for comments? Um, is there a reason to extend it? The MSC's opinion is a lot to consider. Uh, it was uh, submitted recently and finalized and discussed today, so that's why I was asking it. You'll be extending deadline, the deadline for comments the next week, early next week, maybe. Caller, it's What's very the hard to hear you. When is the comment deadline now? Is it this week? Yeah, it's this week. It's this week. So, good question. The comment deadline is Thursday. Thursday, okay. The so, 10th. Uh, staff, uh, you, you, you've got to finalize materials for the board and the board meetings later this month. That's, uh, 
uh, your call as to whether you can allow more time or not, of course. Yeah, I mean, this is Greg. I think, you know, the challenge we have is we like to get the comments in prior to the uh, documents going in for the EIM governing body meeting as well as the board meeting coming up. So we have an EIM governing body meeting coming up on the 16th, so documents for that meeting will be posted on Monday the 14th. So we really don't have, you know, a lot of extra time to be extending the comments deadline or else we wouldn't be able to include the feedback from the stakeholders within the, the documents that we provide to those those governing bodies. So that we're kind of under a bit of a time crunch here. So Greg, this is John. The, the only uh, area where we could is since we're pushing the deb out, um, all other elements, as Greg says, need to move forward promptly. The deb, um, we're, we're gonna be exploring that further and taking that to the December board. Um, Cool. Yeah, that's that's um, a very good point, John. I mean, I think we could we could extend we could extend the deadline for the deb portion, which it seems like that's where a lot of the comments would be coming in on. In any event, uh, I know the MSC opinion spent a lot of time on that subject, which is part of the reason why we wanted to move that out so we could have some further discussions on the deb piece of this. So, yeah, I think that's a good point, John. We could probably extend the common deadline for the deb portion, but for all of the other pieces of this will really need to stick to the current deadline. Yeah, and so um, I guess the question is how much time, because it would be good to get um, the comments on the MSC's perspectives on the storage debt, because that um, is influencing our uh, path forward on the debt. So um, again, I'm just shooting in the dark, maybe another week or something so that Gabe can absorb those comments. What do you, any input, Gabe? Um, yeah, I, I, I think we need to be careful about the deadline. Uh, maybe we should take this back and, and think carefully about the date, but um, I'm inclined to sort of stick with the dates that we have right now. Uh, presumably uh, with the uh, process this fall, there'll be other opportunities for comments on the, on the devs. Um, so this is yeah. Not uh, so for the for the default energy bid specifically, yeah, we're going to have another paper. Uh, I'm trying to get that out the door um, about a week from right now, and then we do have a uh, meeting that we've tentatively set aside some time for in about two weeks. Um, so we'll be discussing it there at that meeting, and there will be a comment period after that. Uh, but I, I would just sort of stress that. We are thinking about this very much like we're in, you know, sort of a draft final proposal here where, you know, we're considering some of the changes that the MSC has put forward in, in this opinion, um, not all, not everything, uh, but, but a few small changes. And um, we're going to put that out there for stakeholder discussion, but we're not really opening up um, the entire default energy bid for stakeholder discussion. For, for the most part, you know, I, I think most of what we have right now is pretty well baked and pretty far along, and we're not really looking to rework the entire process, just sort of opinions and weighing in on um, the changes that the MSC opinion has suggested for the DEB. Yeah, I was only referring to the DEB proposal, extending comments on the DEB proposal. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, um, we will have more information on that. Um, in the next week, but we will be publishing a um, paper on the storage default energy bid, and that will include some timelines for um, uh, additional feedback. Uh, but specifically, that feedback is you know, mainly going to be focused on um, the, the changes that we're contemplating due to this opinion. Thank you. So let's do this. Let's, yeah. So let's just go ahead and keep the submission uh, deadline for the comments on the opinion. And like Abe said, we have more process coming up that's going to uh, discuss these uh, MSC opinions as we've incorpor or incorporating them into our storage debt. So there will be more bites at the apple, if you will, um, in our process. So let's, let's do that. Thanks for the explanation. You bet. All right, Ben. 
Okay, I think we're I, I think we're done then, and we'll see everybody tomorrow. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Andre, I think this concludes the call. Thank you, and that concludes the conference. Much. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhanced. You may now disconnect.